he goes I'm gonna offer you a job I said I appreciate it but I'm gonna have to decline and then he was like should we both leave then together and I was like what <laughs> he was like yeah if you're gonna leave I'll leave as well I, I didn't believe him if I'm honest he'd been CEO for about seven years but he'd been in the job about 14 years so yeah again it's like huh? in 2018 i was the face of the linkedin campaign i was literally everywhere where were you <laughs> tottenham court road manchester birmingham newcastle leeds on all the biggest billboards and you know what if i'm being completely honest i'm just proud of us as a company look at the types of projects that we've been able to work on over the course of time and you haven't even been going five solid solid years i think that is a real testament to just us and the hardware that we've put in obviously yes i'm a black british woman so I'm passionate about my blackness, but actually I'm also just passionate about people and making sure that equity across the board is pushed to the forefront. Hi, I'm Shani and this is how I became co-founder and Hillis Talent at The Elephant Room. They say looks can be deceiving, so today we're going to take more than a glance. Our guest today spent a large part of her life teaching and practicing dance bringing the grit of street culture to the heights of boardrooms, a freedom fighter for the underrepresented to have a voice too. Growing up in Birmingham, faced with challenges and adversity, to setting up her own life in London and guest lecturing at university. An exemplar of the phrase, practice what you preach, and in her own words, what's the point of learning if you have no intention to teach? That's great. I feel like <laughs> um, freaking my fingers. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Pleasure to have you here. Some some lyrics from Ash yeah. describing your life. And that's the story we have in store for everybody watching and listening today. You became co-founder of The Elephant Room and Tell of Talent, aged 23. Mm -hmm. Your previous role was an intern yes. at Iris. Mm -hmm. And your business partner, uh, the founder, was the CEO of that company. Yes. How, that is the question we're going to answer today. How do you become co-founder of the Elephant Room at 23 years old and your previous job was an intern? Not only have you done that, you've advised UK government as a member of the Race Disparity Advisory Board and a lecturer at Kingston University, as we heard in Ash's poem and named in Adweek's future female list in 2020. And that's really just scratching the surface. So let's unpack that today. How does one do that so we can learn how to reach those levels? Let's go back 1994. <laughs> Shani Mears enters the world yeah. and uh, you were born in Birmingham, grew up on the Riley Birch estate. Mm -hmm. What would you say were the positive influences in your early years growing up and, and just paint a picture for us so we can step into the shoes of Shani at this, uh, this time. I think the positive things around me was definitely like my family. I'm the youngest of four and there's really big age gaps between myself and my siblings. So I think it was really nice because actually mom, my sister kind of felt like my mom and then I also have my mom. So it was like a really close knit family um, for like the immediate family that we have me and my brother are closer in age uh, we're only four years apart but I think it was just really nice to know that there's like a I always say it's like a protective energy around me um, and also same with like my friends like I still have my childhood friends that I grew up with in Birmingham like my girls and again they were all like a little bit older than me so I'd say like there's like a good four or five years between us so I think growing up, I've always had, I'd say, like really good influence um, from friends and family around me. And I, I also had, I think, uh, really good like words of words of encouragement from. Yeah, just like teachers and like youth workers, like there was there was always some form of positivity that I felt like would be poured into me. Um, and for me, that made me understand like the real value of like feeling empowered um from a young age and I think from that I then took influence to do things that I really liked or enjoyed i.e dancing you know I, I loved dancing from like super young and I was encouraged to do it because of that energy that I had around me so 
I started dancing and when I was about seven, eight. And um, I started teaching when I was about 12, 13. And again, like that confidence I think came from someone saying to me, like, yeah, you can do that, yeah, you can do it. Like, we'll give you the we'll give you the studio. Do you want to do it? Like, do you know what I mean? And I think it you don't often get that as a child or as a young teen, I'd say. Was there so your your mother and your father of Jamaican heritage? Mm-hmm. Was what were the positive influences of of the of that for you? Yeah, I mean, I love my Jamaican culture. My dad died when I was four, so I feel like I feel like he's left a lot of that with um with the family and like with my mom and stuff. But like my mom is definitely like a pure avid Jamaican woman, and I say that like she's been here over thirty four years, but it feels like she came here yesterday and it's just because of everything from the way she speaks to how she cooks obviously like there's like traditional I'll say like values or morals and in terms of how she like thinks and stuff and that isn't necessarily always um we don't always agree on those things because I'm much more westernized because I was born here in Britain but uh but I do feel like that strong cultural heritage has had a lot to do with like the way in which I just view the world so you know like whether it be the 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 interests that I have and the types of things that I listen to and the types of people I'm around or my style etc I think a lot of that is influenced definitely from like me being a proud um sort of yeah first generation Jamaican Mm -hmm. and I think as well like I I again I didn't necessarily quote unquote have the immigrant experience but my mom definitely did and I feel like her like telling stories about like you know like simple things like just being kind to people or you never know what people are going through so I always smile like those kind of feels that I feel like she's embedded that in me because she knew that she appreciated that when she first came to this country like just being welcomed so I feel like she embedded that in me like making sure that I welcome everybody regardless of where they're from. And you shared with us that so as you said at four years old your father passed away Mm -hmm. and you shared that your mother would share instill his values and lessons you know from him Mm -hmm. in you you and and your brothers and sisters tell us about 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 that my dad was like a really big education man so education was really important to him he was a big family man as well so like family is very important to him and my mum made sure that everyone knew that I have nephews as well and like yeah my older sisters and stuff so we we make sure between ourselves we tell each other almost every day how important we are to each other and you know like making sure we're expressing ourselves like outwardly with like you know I love you or be safe today and stuff like that and like that was really important for my dad to like for that expression and I think he would be proud of that as well in terms of like how that sort of stayed close what do you think your father would say about you know what you've achieved and what you're doing now yeah I think I think he'll be proud I think so I mean I feel like it's one of them ones where you know what I hear a lot of stories about my dad from other people through other people um and a lot of them do say oh like your dad would be so proud like he'd be so proud I'm like I hope so because <laughs> because I, I can't see myself doing anything else at this point but at the same time you just never know in it because uh, you know my mom says that he was a very opinionated person and I'm a very opinionated person so I don't know if he would have the same opinions or if it would be clashing right now I don't know but but I feel like um based on everything that my mom has tried to embed into us and whether that be personal or professional and I still don't even think my mum fully understands what I do to be honest but I feel like she also feels like yeah if your dad was here he'd be like well done like well done like you did what you needed to do kind of vibe so yeah even though she doesn't fully understand it herself so I think I think I think I'd be proud I resonate with aspects of that going from when I chose to study film Mm. as a you know just leaving leaving my teenage years and I spoke to my my grandmother who was like proper Jamaican you know yeah. never lost the accent Hardcore. been here since the 60s yeah and originally she was like you know I would have preferred you to have been a doctor or yeah. you know one of those professions but it was only later on when I was able to show her certain things that I'd made and even video of my granddad's funeral where she couldn't attend a certain bit 
Right. And she's like, I got where you did that now. Yeah. You know, yeah. and she kind of gave the blessing. Yeah. Gave yeah. the blessing. It was always there, but she kind of really connected yeah, on gave. why I did it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's important. I think, I think like uh, in 2018, in 2018, I was the face of the LinkedIn campaign. They like, they probably played it down to me firstly. Because they were like, oh, yeah, we're just going to take a couple of shots. We'll need two days of your time. It won't be nothing like a two minute film. So I was like, oh, OK, cool. Like I was so chill. Like, OK. But literally they were like, it was like a real big thing. Like I was literally everywhere. Where were you? <laughs> I was like Tottenham Court Road, Manchester, Birmingham, Newcastle, Leeds on all the biggest billboards, yeah. Oxford Circus, Hackney, Stockwell, Brixton, like everywhere. <laughs> Hackney was all and over. And I was just yeah. like, OK. Um, can you guys send me the sites? Because I did not know that this was going to be that big. But then there was also a film that came out. And one of, uh, one part of that film was also shot in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And they basically shut down my whole street. Um, and my mom was in the film for a, a part of it. And she was like, I just didn't know you were, you, what? <laughs> I didn't know that this was a thing. Like, <laughs> she was like, I didn't know that, like, your voice was so important. Like, and I, and I think at that point, it kind of clicked for her. Like, okay, I see it now. Like, I get it. Like, I get why you do what you're doing, why you're so passionate about it. And I like, I understand, even though I don't fully understand what it is you're doing, I understand that it's important to you. And if it's important to you, it's important to me kind of vibe. And I feel like we, we, we really connected at, at that. Yeah, yeah. I feel like sometimes parents can see their children going into creative fields thinking that they could be chasing waterfalls or something mm. trying to you know be that person on the tv when really there's so much around it and it all comes down to that expression of oneself I, I yeah find, you absolutely know? i think there's always a period where you just have to stay quiet mm. and do <laughs> what you're doing <laughs> and you're going to hear things from family friends like what, what about yeah doctor or this or mm. that or what about that that why are you doing what is it and you just have to stay. There's nothing really you can say until there's something that kind of comes out, you know, that they can see or feel or touch and hold on to. Like, OK, yeah, there's yeah. a film crew on our street and they shut it down. Yeah. And Shani's face is all over the country. <laughs> well, I don't get it, but she must be doing something yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And that's the point. You don't need to talk then. You just it's there. Yeah. And I think that's sometimes people can struggle with that. They try and explain and explain and it just gets worse yeah just do the work and and get a result and that and they'll be happy with that and that's what i've just been doing like i've just been doing the work really like mm. and to be honest uh, it, 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 when you do the work and you expect nothing in return that's when i feel like you get it tenfold mm -hmm. so like when so many things happen around me or i get awarded something or i get put on a list or I get asked to do like a big interview or do like advisory at Downing Street. Oh, I'm like, what the hell? Like, what Why are you? you? Doing? Yeah, like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, what are you doing? Like, and I'm just like, I don't know. I'm just doing, I'm just doing what I, I think is right. Do you know what I mean? And then, um, and then, yeah, I suppose you just, you just reap the reward of that and then off the back of that, people see. What experiences did you have to go through? like living in the part of Birmingham that you did, you mentioned to us before that there was, you faced a lot of adversity from groups such as the National Front. Kind of what did that teach you at that age of growth? Yeah, like, so the area I grew up in was like mostly known for like the NF territory, EDL. And to be honest, that was my understanding of racism at the time. Like, I just thought like they came in a certain way, like, bold heads big boots like do you know what I mean like that's kind of my understanding of what racism was the types of people that were racist I just I just I just thought and that's you just deal with it like because we that's our area this is our ends do you know what I mean but I think what I also realized was it's not something that racism is not something that like you turn on or turn off like it exists do you know what I mean? And I think at the time, my mum, to be fair to her, also didn't really know how to explain it to me in a sense where it was just like, this is what you're going to face. It was more of a case of like, I suppose back then it was more a case of being protective and around survival of like, 
making sure you don't go to certain areas or explaining to me and my brother that we can't attend this school so we're going to go to this school instead or making sure that we're home by a certain time because this is what's going to happen or when the EDL march is happening we're not going out so trying to explain to us like these things are happening so this is why you're not going to be able to do that etc again at the time it was just like okay then like (laughs) we'll just go to another area so although I grew up on the Wiley Birch estate like I mentioned which during that time had a lot of people like National Front, etc. I actually grew up really in two other places where I went to school, which was a place called Aston and a youth club around Newtown. And that's much more, um, much more, I would say, multicultural, black-centered, Asian, Somalian. Like I grew up amongst those people and me really. And I think that's just because naturally we felt more welcomed. So. I'd say I've had two experiences whereby my understanding of racism at the time was that, but it was kind of just like you avoid it, you keep away from it, and you go where you're welcomed. And where we were welcomed were these areas where I went to school, etc. So I was I felt like I was explored I was exposed in a good in a good way to other things that I hadn't been exposed to before. So like that's like Islam culture, Muslim culture, and just like understanding what that what that is and like for me as a Christian like what that looks like and stuff like that so I still feel like there was positives to it because I feel like that wouldn't have pushed me to those spaces if I didn't have that experience of where I was growing up initially but then at the same time I feel like it was always a case of like what I've realized now as I've got older there was this always the case of being the bigger person and like I remember like having a next door neighbor and like you you like you know I just like calling me names and like it was ne I was never ever told to retaliate like it was always it's okay like just keep your head down don't and I was just like that's so unfair like do you know what I mean like that's so unfair and so tiring to always have to be the bigger person even though you're the one that's being attacked like it makes no sense but I I also understand it because obviously you don't want to build confrontation or the more experiences I had like that the more I kind of just started to think okay this is just not right like but you've always been taught to not say anything or to not be confrontational or to make sure that you don't live up to a stereotype of being the angry black woman or always always being cheeky or hard to handle so how are you going to articulate yourself in a more positive or how are you going to bring positivity to the forefront and I think that's where I started to explore like the more the art and like using an artistic form or an artistic way to like talk about the things that was going on or to express myself in ways in which that I felt like I didn't really get to express or and that's when I really started dancing and taking it seriously and thinking yeah like this is what I want to do and I want to talk about bullying and I want to talk about all those different things and I think at that point I was probably about when I really wanted to do all those things I think I was probably at 14 15 and I I started doing like my workshops and um looking like for ways in which I could talk about what was happening around me so so you see, what age was that where you started to look to to talk about what was happening I would say proper properly I'd say about 14 15 so you're 14 years old but still very young and mm-hmm. what what are you thinking I, I'm I've seen these things in my life and I want to talk about them change things what's yeah. going through your mind yeah so I'm so I'm already a part of quite a few like community groups I'm part of my youth center I'm already a, a part of all those things so I'm like now 15 I'm like okay I've just started I've just started a crew like as in like a part of, I've joined a dance crew um and I've just completed my arts award and I'm just like okay you know what I think I can do this like I've got enough people around me and support around me to be able to do stuff. So I've looked into, oh my gosh, ages ago, but I've looked into something called the V Inspired and they were like, used to give away funding. Um, and I think I applied for like 1,500 pounds. You're doing, this is at 14 you're doing this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah it's about 14. Mm. Um, and I put on like workshops, like kids between the age of 17 to 16 about bullying and dealing with like racial tension. Mm. um that's interesting because you you said to us that 
from about eight years old, you had friends that were 12, 13, mm. like four, five years older. Mm -hmm. So, and now you're setting up, you know, 14 years old, setting up initiatives and workshops for, again, people older than you. Was that always the case? You think it's because of your brothers and sisters being older that, how did that come about? Yeah. yeah, I think so. And I think I just had a network of older people around me as well. So like naturally it just felt, it would have felt strange to like only do it for like say 12 year olds or 30, could you know what I mean? Cause I felt like we were all going through it. We just all had different ways of expressing it. And like, I remember telling you the story of like being with my friend who's mixed, mixed heritage. Her mom's white, her dad's black. And she lived with her mom, but her dad lived like far away. And we were literally like in my area and this guy was just like, oh, go back, go back to your own country. Like, it was just so strange. Like, what the hell? Like, even repeating it, it still feels surreal to me. Because I'm just like, how can you be saying that? I was literally about eight or nine. Like, I didn't even understand what you were saying. And then she, like, called her dad. And her dad's, like, came straight away. Like, and literally, literally beat him up. And that is not the right thing to do at all. Like, but it's like, but that's how real it was for us, like, we would literally just be outside my house or like on our street and it wasn't even safe at that point because you couldn't go anywhere without someone calling you a name or do you know what I mean or saying a racial slur so at that point now we're just thinking you know what this isn't cool but then me I had the the I said I said I was lucky enough to have that dual duality of the world so I had like my youth group my school which was multicultural friends from all different like spaces and then I also had obviously my home life and like my area. So I, I feel like I had a good mix of understanding like, okay, what, what does this look like? So when I was like, yeah, 14, 15, I just said, uh, uh, yeah, I want to apply. I want to apply for some funding. That's amazing. <laughs> There's very that, yeah. few, I mean, um, imagine 14, 15 year olds who are thinking like that, you know, mm. okay. I, firstly, I want to do something about this and take action, you know, and be part of the change. And secondly, to then, yeah, get out there and find the right thing, find the funding. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that has, a, that sort of mindset has allowed you to achieve or led you to achieve the things you have, you know, today, later in life? Yeah, I mean, when I look at it now, yes. I didn't think so before, because at the time, you're just kind of thinking of the now, like you're thinking of what I'm going to do right now. But when I think about it and like look back at all the things I've done, I'm like oh actually I've probably been like this since I was about six <laughs> do you know what I mean like I've probably been like I've been quite entrepreneurial quite proactive quite opinionated I've always cared about people so I'd probably describe myself as a bit of an empath like it, all those things have been quite important to me and 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 as well like regardless of obviously yes I'm I'm a black British woman so I'm passionate about my blackness but actually, I'm also just passionate about people and making sure that equity across the board is is pushed to the forefront. So regardless of who you are, what you do, how you think, how you feel, you feel like you belong in a space where is welcoming for you. And I think that's really important, even if I don't share your exact experience. So now I think about it, probably yes, like absolutely like led me to where I am today but I didn't know that I, I was just doing what I felt was right do you know what I mean and at 14 15 you're not really deep in it like you just you just doing what you think is is right and you know it's like it's like in school I, I you know I was I was like head girl for like most of my years in like secondary school and people would always vote me and I was just like sometimes I'd even put myself forward but and, and like but there but but I just always used to talk about stuff that I cared about and I used to I used to also like be friends with all the naughty kids but I was also friends with all the good kids and like I think that 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 like ability to be able to exist in both spaces and I myself was not naughty at all but for some reason, all my, all my friends were just bad. And, but they, but they actually, when I think about it now as well, when I really think about it now, they actually weren't even bad kids. They just, they just didn't, they just didn't take in education information the same as me or other people in the classroom. So they needed a little bit more support, but actually the system wasn't, wasn't set up for them. So in, 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 you know, I suppose a, 
as a result of that they just retaliated in ways in which that you know they were then labeled as like naughty or bad or rude and stuff like that but actually they just needed more support ultimately I remember I didn't actually take it in until after uni to be fair but I did dance performance at university and at the time I was I was very very like hit up on being a dancer being a choreographer so my you know my plan was to train then go to Japan train again um I even took Japanese at uni like everything like was that's what I was gonna do then I just realized like wow like all my teachers were white like I was hardly taught by anyone under the age of 40 like I just I just didn't understand it because dance is such a universal language mm-hmm. and there's so many different art art uh, artistic ways in which as a practitioner you're supposed to learn. So I was thinking, what is this? And then when I decided to do my um dissertation on the emancipation of the black female body, which was looking at like objectification and like, you know, the sort of the emancipation of dance itself and black dance, my teachers were just like, Yeah, why? Nah. Like this is it's not that interesting. I was like, well, of course you don't find that interesting. You probably don't even know what I'm talking about. Like, do you know what I mean? And I, and I just realized like how important that is to have that experience throughout because when you then come to do something that you want to do, but then no one understands it because they either don't come from the same cultures or they, they don't care about that culture, etc. It really shapes you. And I didn't get the grade I wanted, but I was so proud of the work that I did because no one had done that before. Do you know what I mean? And everyone who got to experience that piece of work that I did also felt it do you know what I mean they really felt it and I was like you know what job done then because and I I, I vividly remember me and my mom having a conversation and my mom coming to see my piece and me saying to my mom I was like mom I didn't get the grade I wanted like I worked so hard like I didn't get the grade I wanted and she was just like oh yeah but are you proud of the work like do you feel like you tried your best and are you proud of that piece of work? And I was just like, yeah, I'm really proud of it. She was just like, well, then it's fine. It doesn't matter. Like, don't, like, don't, don't let them put you in that box. Do you know what I mean? And that, and that is that stayed with me, like, literally, like, ever since, because I genuinely was so proud of that work. But because I didn't get the grade I wanted, it almost made, made me feel like, oh, well, maybe I didn't do a good job. And it made me start to doubt it. You know, when we talk a lot about, like, imposter syndrome and, all them kind of things it's like that's what brings that on but ultimately it's just a case of not really having people that understand you grade you do you know what i mean mm, yeah um, it's, it sounds like now you're doing the same things but you're getting appreciation for it and you're getting yeah the kind of external validation for it with you know the linkedin campaign and mm. you know invited to interviews and on these lists like people see the value in what you're doing now maybe they didn't see it then but you've got that same mindset approach. Of, yeah. There's a theme here that you see the problems around you and you do something about it. And I think yeah. that sounds like a core part of what's what's led you to achieve what you have. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, and I just do. I just do it. I don't, so, I don't even really think about it. I just do it. If you have goals and ambitions within your personal life, career or business and would like to overcome the challenges that you face, inspire people and get to your goals faster then a coach might be the right solution for you go to weunify.co.uk forward slash coach now back to the show i think an important part of your life or maybe influential part which still plays to it to today which you talk about a lot is at 10 11 years old your sister develops mental health issues yeah yeah and which is still ongoing mm-hmm. Did you understand what that was as a 10, 11 year old and how did that impact you? Yeah, no, not at all. I mean. Talk us through what, what happened. How did you find out? So, my sister, so firstly, my sister was a real OG. Yeah. <laughs> she was a real OG, like a real influence for me anyway. Like, I would say, like, she's like the core part of all my influence when it comes to music, 90s, R&B, hip hop, like, she was the coolest person I knew when it came to dressing. Like, she was just so cool. And how many years old is she? She's about, uh, I want to say about 13 years older than me. So I'm like, let's say I'm like, probably like six, seven. And she's like, maybe like 20, 21. So 
she's like the coolest person I've known really <laughs> at this point. Everywhere she's going, I want to go with her. Like that's kind of I had like you almost kind of have her on a pedestal or to an extent really. She had a period where she probably was at this point now I understand that she's probably going through like mental health issues like like depression and stuff like that and no one really understood it in our family if I'm honest no one so she then resulted in um yeah just hanging around with I suppose the wrong crowd or um smoking drinking all of that kind of stuff how did you know there was something wrong how did the family know she just wasn't herself like what were the signs like withdraw like don't want to really go out anymore like paranoia like and she was someone that used to go out all the time all the time like yeah it was just the complete opposite of her really she was out and she would take me with her as well like I was literally like her like her little I was like her little sister really so she would just take me and we'd go everywhere so and then I just stopped like it just stopped happening how old was she when this started to happen um I'd say about 22 and at that point, we kind of just thought she was going through a phase. So again, it wasn't even really like, okay, like, okay, maybe she's just like, you know, people have down days, that kind of thing. And then, yeah, when I was about nine, ten, we had a police officer come to the door and was like, oh, we've had to arrest um, my, my sister um, for shoplifting. And my mom was like, huh? <laughs> this is so strange what why would she be shoplifting like what in the world like she so my mom fully really didn't understand it and um so then she said to me my mom said to me go and call your brother and like my brother's upstairs at this point um and then we've we've gone to my sisters my other sisters my eldest sister so my sister saying my mom's like okay you need to watch the kids because i need to go and understand what in the world is going on why like yeah and then she just wasn't behaving correct like you know just laughing not really taking it seriously and the police was like ah oh, we recommend you doing some form of mental health check or like going to see somebody because clearly something isn't right like i don't like we don't think something's right basically like yes we've had to arrest her but we don't think she needs like she's not a shoplifter clearly mm-hmm. do you know what i mean like something's not right so my mom's like okay okay cool so now we're like proper thinking okay something's obviously not right like we've got to look into it so my mom starts researching talking to lots of different people talking to friends sharing what's going on da, 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 da. um and then yeah and then we take her eventually she gets to this like mental health home or whatever and they said yeah like she sh- they think she has a form of psychosis um and they're gonna have to section her and then they did um, how and was then, that for you at the time well i didn't really understand what was happening so you, I just, how old were you when she got sectioned i was about 10 mm. so i was just like all i know is that my sister's acting crazy and that's how i would label it at the time and she needs help and i'm actually at this point i'm actually kind of scared of her like because she's not the person that i knew or that i I thought i knew do you know what i mean and um my brother even he's a bit like my brother's like he understands what's happening but he doesn't really know how to articulate his feelings about it as well so he's my, my brother's well, growing up he was very quiet very very quiet hardly spoke to anyone so now we're, we're like we're all just not talking it's just all weird like it's just a weird dynamic and um like everyone starts to chip in now and this is why i talk about like good people around you like my brother's godmother he's she's taking him for the weekend my sister's like even though she's like literally like on her second like just on her second child now at this point and she, she's got two kids she's obviously got her husband she's buying her new house i remember like she's going through such a transition but she was like it's all right shan can stay with me that like, everyone's like sort of chipping in now whilst my mom is figuring out what is going on with my sister and then for the most part she she cooperated my sister like you know she was getting checked up she got a social work like not a social worker but like a help like a work like a worker that would check mm-hmm. in with her 
um she even got a boy new boyfriend he was like really supportive um and and it was going all right it was cool and then she relapsed and then my mom was just like i don't know what i don't know what i don't know what's going on i don't know if she's i don't know if it's drugs i don't know if she's smoking i don't know what's going on like now she won't talk to me and she just it felt like she would have like a good couple of years and then she'd like it would like relapse in almost and then she'd have another good couple of years but she's just always remained ill ultimately i would say lockdown which is recent really um has been the worst she's ever been and i think that's due to lockdown mm. you know not being able to see anyone not be having access to really the outside world being in your own thoughts and a lot of people with mental health issues were neglected at that point like you know she wasn't a, a, a work a, a, a health worker or social worker didn't see her for about a year and a half like they would she would have check-ins on the phone but they were like five minutes like you know it was like very like mishandled i think how has this impacted you over the years I think you just become like not desensitized but you kind of like you almost just prepare yourself for the worst in it that like you, you you prep yourself over time you withdraw and I and, and I know that I know those things about me so like it's not like a um and I would say out of everyone in my family I'm the most transparent that would ever sit down and even talk about it in an interview <laughs> like um like yeah because everyone else is probably just doesn't want to talk about it or doesn't want to have to face that part of what, what as a family that we're facing but ultimately like for me I just think it's important to talk about things because you don't know how many people are going through that and the more I've shared what's happened with my sister the more people have then shared with me like oh my gosh I've got a cousin that x or you know what yeah my my brother too has has had something really similar and I'm like wow like I just didn't know that so many people had so many people close to them going through ultimately some of the same issues and same things yeah i think you're right in that you know if you if everybody stays quiet about it and doesn't talk about it it's not going to get any better yeah, for anybody exactly. and having the conversation people hearing you talk about it and that may just inspire them to reach out to a family member or say to a family member we should do something about this you know it gets that solution conversation happening which is what it needs to be not mm -hmm. let's put it aside and not, not talk about it yeah there's so many things and I think culturally as well like I don't know if it's Jamaican culture I don't know if it's black culture I don't know what it is but there's this thing about having whatever is said keeps in the household and it doesn't go anywhere else and 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 I get that to an extent but I also just think that yeah but we're all suffering here like it's not just one person suffering we're all suffering and we've all dealt with it in many different ways you know what I mean like me I feel like I'm a I've I've definitely developed into this sort of nomad like I don't have attachment to things or places I'll happily move away <laughs> and be away from everything <laughs> if I can avoid it and like and I know that that a part of that is probably like due to trauma do you know what I mean but 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 also on the flip side it's also nice because I like experiencing things and new people and new things and that's how I, I just deal with it my brother a young black man like dealing with lots of different issues and he talks about it well with me about like being real um isolated in a family full of women <laughs> and not having a father figure and then dealing with seeing his sister deteriorate like who does he go to to talk about that with because it's hard when there's no male figure and then you're supposed to be the man but then you also have your own emotions that you don't know how to deal with so then that's there's that and then what's your what's your advice there what's just what's the solution do you think i mean my, my um and i mean he knows this and if he ever watches this he'll be like oh my god but like my advice to him is to is to feel everything uh, like regardless if you're a man or not like feel everything that you're going through like you don't have to hide any form of emotion because you feel like your gender will be associated to x or y do you know what i mean i feel like it's important that yes of course it's gonna, it's gonna be challenging because you've never had to do that before 
but ultimately what you're feeling is very it's, you're, it's very valid so there is no reason to hide or there is no reason to not feel like you can't share because you're surrounded by women or you know we feel free to cry and you don't always feel that free like do you know what I mean like feel it because there's no judgment here do you know what I mean and also as well like to take like take your time like there's no rush do you know what I mean like no one's forcing you to express yourself right now it's just it's just making sure that you do or you eventually get to a place where you you can we know as well that mental health is the biggest killer for you know young men under the age of 45 and when it comes to suicide so I always think about that like it literally is at the forefront of my mind like I never want him to ever feel like he doesn't have me or anyone because it's important do you know what I mean and it's always the the people you least expect to like say that they're suffering and and like you'd like what like I would have never have guessed it so yeah my advice is always to just be open and and be expressive and talk about it and know that you've got you know yet yeah, like we are here if you need if you need okay so we're gonna fast forward now mm-hmm. you go to a commentary university mm-hmm. and you graduate and you get a traineeship at liberty which yeah. is a youth marketing agency yeah. onto the digify 2016 program mm-hmm which is a program designed to help those who identify as ethnic minority get into the advertising industry um, and do a short course in marketing. So how did, you, how did you find that? And then how did that then lead to your internship at Iris? To be honest, I, I had already known Liberty as an agency. So I'd done a one week work experience with them in summer 2015. Um, and when I did that, they had said to me, oh, we've got an internship launching the end of the year we're going to keep you posted about it because we think you'd be good to apply. So I had in mind, oh, okay, I know that this opportunity is coming. I don't, I don't really know if it's coming, but I know that they've, they've told me about it. So that's how I found out about it. I then applied in November, got through to the interview stage, got the job. And at this point, the interview stage is like December, but I think the start date is like January. So I'm like, oh, wow, okay. So if I really do get this, I'm 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 moving in like three weeks. So you're in Birmingham at the at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm in Birmingham. And the job Liberty's in London. Liv- yeah, yeah. I said to my mum, I was like, Mum, I'm interviewing <laughs> for this internship. Like it's eight months. I don't know what's gonna happen, but I got a goal soon if if I get it. And I was actually pretty confident. I must say that I was gonna get it. Like we'd built a really good relationship. I. I felt like I demonstrated the right types of skills to get it. So if I didn't get it, I, I would have been like, what? Like, what? Why didn't I get this? So I, I, I started looking for like places to live, etc. And then, yeah, I did, I did get it. So I was literally like in London the first week of January. How was that moving down? I, w- I just wanted a place that I felt comfortable in. And I did. And I was living in Lewisham. And Lucian to me felt like Birmingham. Like it was just, it was, it was so homely. So it was all right. And then the commute was cool. It was just getting to the, you know, getting to understand London a little bit more that I had to start navigating. And then I started to meet more people in London and it was good. Yeah. So how did this opportunity at Iris come up? As a part of Digify. So you do a, it was like a short course interview not interview but internship with liberty however they had 10 agencies signed up to then take on those interns so iris was a part of the 10 basically and over the two months you visited all the agencies they got to know you all you done like a, it was like a really intensive speed interview process where they all came you would go around they would like give you like shot like hot shot questions and then the following week they'd pick who they wanted and they picked me <laughs> so so this is iris they picked you yeah and to for those who don't know iris is a company that's got 10 at least offices around the world yeah i'd say about yeah about eight, eight to ten offices across eight. the world like mm. new york la sydney singapore yeah. a very big company global mm-hmm. company yeah. And they saw Shani and thought, she's incredible. 
<laughs> let's get her involved. Yeah, it was actually myself and another girl. So they mm -hmm. took two of us. It was myself and mm -hmm. another girl called Nicole, which was actually also quite comforting, to be fair, because I was like, oh, yes, I'm like, I'm not going alone. Mm -hmm. um, but we were very different in terms of skill set. So Nicole was much more creative and content led. Um, to be honest, I didn't know what I was. <laughs> I didn't really know what I You're was just I doing just, you as you yeah, always had just, done yeah. yeah I didn't really I'm I'm not a creative I am creative I'm creative but I'm not a creative well clearly you know people people were seeing something special and one of those people would be Dan mm -hmm. so he is CEO of this company you joined and you're an intern mm -hmm. and they're doing a they do a reverse or a mentoring scheme no, within they, the company no, they didn't. They didn't. But although Dan did interview me, though. He was one of the interviews. It was mm -hmm. him and a, another guy called Dave Austin, who was the senior planner. Um, that's the first time you met Dan in that, that interview. I'd met him. No, I, I'd also met him when we visited. So actually, to be fair, he was actually quite hands-on as a CEO during the process of the program. So he wanted to know like who the interns were. He met them. He 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 had come down to the um like the the interview process so and it was a big deal at the time because I didn't have a relationship with him at all so we were like whoa the CEO's come like this is like this must be a big thing like do you know what I mean but he was mad cool and he was really curious and I think that's why we got on anyway Grey Matters new business tip for today new business is about playing the long game prospects can take years to nurture and deals sometimes take several months to close if a client is not ready to buy Set regular activities in your diary or CRM and use valuable content and insights to nurture. But they may not be ready now, but when they are, you will be at the forefront of their mind. Grey Matters is a straight-talking business development consultancy that empowers agencies to position, market and sell themselves for new business success. And then I started, a, I started like, a, like a newsletter to just talk about the stuff that I was into. I sent it around every week on a Friday called the Urban Lowdown. <laughs> and it was all about black culture and everything that was happening in my world and everything that I was into outside of advertising. So that was music, fashion, anything that I felt was just really cool, to be honest. Anything that I just thought, this is sick. <laughs> like, I'm going to share this. So... And I remember things like Drake dropping views, Skepta dropping Konnichiwa, like selling out the like just things that were happening that I thought this is sick. Like we should be no, we should know about stuff like this. Um, Willow Smith had just become the first um teen black ambassador for Chanel. Like just stuff like that that I just was like this is so interesting. Um, I had interviewed Slick Rick at the time because I had joined Guap. Um. And obviously, if anyone knows Slick Rick, he's like a hip hop legend. Like, so I was just like, you know what? I'm going to share all of this. And the more I shared, the more requests I got, like, is it is this going to be a weekly thing? Like, what? Like, we want to know more what's going on. Who's requesting? Who's saying that? Everyone in the agency. Like, right. I don't even know some of the people. I, I don't even know some, some of the people. I, I just used to get, like, Kelly from hr would be like <laughs> like do you know what i mean like it was just random and this is an internal newsletter is it yeah 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 okay. internal okay. i just i just write it every friday mm. yeah. i'm like oh save it to my urban loadout and then like i'd go to an event and i'd i'd write about it mm. or i'd hear a talk and i'd write about it or i'd li I, like i listen to like ted talks or something and i'd i'd i'd, I'd like i'd analyze it a little bit and i'd talk, take out like some key points and it was my way of like kind of extending like okay this is what I'm good at or this is what I'm really into and this is what I can do really well and at the time like I literally knew like all the hot spots for like underground hip-hop raves in London or like any new artists that were coming through at the time like and then and then I actually organized a breakfast um that I was asked to meet the creative department and it was about all the like next like talent that's going to be like popping in the next four to five years and that was like guap who are obviously doing amazing right now um jasmine sarah who's an incredible artist colby martin another incredible artist shay lingo who's a sick rapper but they all came in to meet um iris and that was like my first like responsibility off the back of that urban lowdown like okay 
and I was just like yeah like as an advertising agency we should know these people <laughs> like um and and like yeah and I suppose it's like a result of like also where they are now because you know they've, they've gone on to work with some incredible agencies brands etc and I suppose the agency itself Dan in particular started to be like okay I really understand why this is important for us as an agency that talks about culture and talks about being in culture but actually are we like are we really um and then we yeah he just started booking in meetings with us well his PA started booking in meetings and then we started having like catch-ups and then I remember I got I got asked to do like my first public speaking gig and that was like a agency of 2020 by creative social I don't think they're around anymore um and I did a I did a presentation and that was like a prediction of like the next four years and um and he came and then he wrote yeah Dan Mm -hmm. came and then he wrote about it he actually wrote a long essay about my talk sent it around to the whole agency and I was like whoa like that's a big deal and I just didn't get random people stopping me in the agency like excuse me are you you she's the one who <laughs> like yeah <laughs> um and I suppose after the back of that I became more confident and I felt a lot more empowered about what I was good at and what I what I felt like I really cared about um and then then they offered me a job so yeah so uh there was a was it an official kind of mentoring relationship going on or you he would just book meetings and you would talk about what would you talk about what was the um how did it it go i mean probably was official because it was like routine and like it quote unquote like there was there was a consistency to it yeah Mm. But it wasn't um, like an official mentoring program. Yeah, say. no, yeah, yeah. But, but it was that like program. Yeah, he would thought, okay, this this person's interesting. You know, um, I'd like to understand this yeah, a bit more, more about it because I mm-hmm. see the value in it yeah. for us as an agency because we're talking about culture. But I'm now realizing we probably weren't doing much about culture or knew about culture. Yeah. And Shani's come along and gone, this is culture. This is what's going on. <laughs> and so yeah. he has these meetings with you. And then you're still in internship and then what happens he tell us about when he offers you a job yeah just going back to what you said about like probably not i think i think they were doing interesting things Mm. but i think they weren't on the pulse as much as they thought they were Mm. so i think it's more a case of like for for a wider context the brands that they were working with were like asking them to do stuff as source things and they were like oh we have the ability to source this but actually we should have the ability to do this at pace and it wasn't happening at pace. It was like going through different loops and hoops. And then like I would talk to like the creative director, for example, on Adidas. And he'd be like, ah, oh, I'm looking for some MCs in Manchester. Do you know any? And I'm like, yeah, of course I do. What? <laughs> like, that's my bread and butter. Do you know what I mean? And he'd be like, all right, cool. And then like they realized that, okay, that's what we need in the agency. People who we can just go and have a conversation with across the desk rather than taking all these processes and to different agencies or agents and stuff so I think it was more about there's something here about process and structure that isn't quite right when it comes to connecting to culture and Shanice is showing us that we have the ability to bridge that gap if we wanted to um and then Dan yeah I suppose yeah got more more intrigued about that and and, and he would just ask me stuff like you know where, where do I come from like what am I into what else am I doing outside of of this he would ask me about Guap because I was I was also working at Guap. He was, you know. Tell us about just briefly what is Guap. Um, so Guap at the time was the world's first video magazine, um, and they are all about estab- like established and emerging creatives, so putting them on. At the time, it was mostly in and around music, but now they're a multi-platform. So they have like a podcast studio. They also have their agency called GA. They have they still have their magazine. And then they also just put out content. So at the moment, for example, they have their mentoring program that they're running with the Adidas Originals. Um, and they're Kurt Geiger's agency. And they are also Kurt Geiger's lead agency now, yes. But initially, I, I, I'd i started with them doing like brand and talent management. So when I was doing all of that, it was super cool because I was writing and I was I was like sourcing like volunteers for writers and editors, etc. Was this full, were you full-time internship at, 
I, Irish? I, yeah, uh, Irish. So how were you doing that and go up? I, d- I don't know. I was just... I don't know. I was just hustling. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Just just balancing the two, I think. And mm. I, I was just taking what I knew and exchanging it. And then, like I said, bringing them in there. And then, yeah, I think he just, he offered me a job. And he was like, he goes, I'm going to offer you a job. We do want to keep you. We don't actually know what the title is, but we do want to keep you. <laughs> so, <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> and I, and Honestly, I I was really happy that they were or wanted to consider me, but I just couldn't do it. I was just like, yeah, nah. I said, I said I appreciate it, but I'm gonna have to decline. Yeah, so what, you, why? Yeah, you got this why? great opportunity. <laughs> you know, it's like job, salary, your life, get on the career ladder. Lots of people. Wouldn't think twice and yeah. they just be like, you, Yes, let's do it. You're a celeb in the agency, people are stopping you. <laughs> what made taking selfies. Go, like, <laughs> Thank you, but no. Yeah, it was literally thank you, but no, thank you. Um Can you remember what was I going think, through your mind? I think at the time I just thought like this is this is sick. Like I've actually surprised myself even, like amazing. However, my day to day is not what I, I imagined it to be. I'm not excited every day. I, I don't get that much responsibility because the reality is I'm an intern and these that don't rate me. So you rate me, but you don't really. Like, do you know what I mean? Um, I I had some instances in the agency itself what I just did, I didn't feel comfortable with. Like what? Just like small stuff. Like I remember vividly someone telling me that, you know, I think you should consider reading more Grazia in OK Magazine. Because, you know, you just need to open up your mind a bit. And I was like, are you joking? It's ironic. <laughs> I was literally like, are you, are you joking? That you've got to be joking. Everyone in this agency reads OK and Cosmopolitan. I'm literally the only person that's probably picking up a vice or Hunger magazine. Mm. And you want me to open up my mind? <laughs> like, what? Like, you, know, you just find yourself having really strange conversations mm. like that. And you think to yourself, wow, OK nah <laughs> like this is not the place for me then like it's just not the place for me the clients were very mainstream so the, although the audiences some of them would have been targeted at maybe young black boys in football mm. but but that wouldn't have been like the main target audience because at the end of the day they still got to sell like a boot which is a universal like football boot so in it, in fairness to them they weren't always trying to target like you know black people or muslim culture or anything like that but it was a case of them feeling like they knew if they got that brief, they knew mm-hmm. that, oh yeah, we could do that. When the reality is they probably couldn't. But but at the same time, I also don't think it was a conscious um, decision. I think it was an unconscious thing like, yeah, like, of course we have the ability to do this. We're one of the best agencies in London. So why wouldn't we take on this challenge? Not knowing that the challenge is a structural challenge. Like you need mm-hmm. to take that on in a structural context inside the agency in order to take on that and I think a lot of these things I would express like around to Dan like I've got no problem working here like I feel like you're a sick agency but the reality is is that it's not my world like and I don't know how welcoming you would be to my world because I'm getting I'm still getting told that I need to read okay magazine and there's obviously a mentality here where I, w- I find myself I'd, I'd probably have to defend myself a lot of the time mm-hmm. rather than feel like oh yeah I can bring new ideas to the table do you know what I mean so it's 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 great me sending a newsletter around and everyone reading that on a Friday but ultimately how many of these ideas are we going to implement that back into the work mm-hmm. do you know what yeah. I mean and you're someone obviously from your life who's been about taking action and making a difference from yeah. 14 years old exactly exactly and obviously they didn't they didn't have that context <laughs> so they really did not l- s- to be honest dan probably even seen more of my potential than i even saw my potential but again it was just like oh yeah but she's like she, how old is she? she's like 21 22 like what does she know like do you know what i mean so and, um, so you yeah. say to dan politely no thanks what do you think is going through his mind huh <laughs> like <laughs> he's like he was like okay 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 why not <laughs> like and um and you know what he was really he was great about it actually he was like 
he asked me why. I think I said why. And then he was like, all right, then cool. He was like, you know what? Fair enough. Fair enough. And then he was like, should we both leave then together? And I was like, what? <laughs> he was like, yeah, I'll leave as well. If you're going to leave, I'll leave as well. And he literally said that. And I was like, but why would you do, why would you do that? <laughs> so this, let's just be clear. This is the CEO of this, of the London mm -hmm. office for this agency. This is the same meeting where he's offered you the job. Mm -hmm. And the same you meeting. said wow. no. And he's then gone. All right. If you're leaving, I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. Just like that. And then what happened? <laughs> and then he was like, okay, I've got to have some conversations first. But, 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 but he was just like, but ultimately let's do it. I, I didn't believe him. If I'm honest, I was a bit like, okay but why would why would you do that that like me turning down a job an internship at junior level i can kind of understand I, I get why people would be like why are you doing that but i can kind of understand what you walking away from your c-suite six-figure salary makes no sense to me <laughs> like what like why would you do that um, and he'd been in that job at the time, what, since 2011, I think he became CEO? Yeah, like 14 years. Like, and he'd been CEO for about seven years, but he'd been <laughs> in the job about 14 years. So, yeah. again, it's like, huh? He'd been managing director in, of the Shanghai office. Yeah, he opened all the office. well, most of the offices around the world, mm -hmm. Singapore, wow. Sydney, like, and... And so this intern comes in, says, I'm leaving. He's like, okay, I'm off too. Yeah, ultimately. And he'll be like, oh, like, you know, if you talk to him, he'll be like, oh, it's all Shani's fault like why we started <laughs> the agency but ultimately like now he he's been he's great because he, one it it takes a lot i think and even just like when when we talk about like it's hard enough as a as a as a young business being taken seriously and saying that you're gonna like you know change advertising mm -hmm. and it's hard enough just having that mission and being whoever you are Never mind me being some 22 year old from Birmingham, like no experience in the advertising world. And then him has this experienced middle class white man saying, oh, yeah, this is my co-founder, by the way. And she's going to be handling all the talent. Like, look at him like, are you crazy? Like, what? Like, who, who qualified this person? <laughs> like, so I feel like he, he really took a risk on himself just doing that because like at this point it's past allyship that's advocacy you're an accomplice mm. at this point do you know what <laughs> i mean and and i think for me it was just more a case of like okay well you you really gotta do this then like you say you're about it and you've been mm. saying that you're about it so this challenge is a real challenge and then that and then we did like we just we sort of just yeah but what on that day do you go did you tell your mother yep what did she say I called my mom She's like, no, 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 I don't trust him. You don't trust him. I don't trust it. Like, she was literally <laughs> like, oh, my mom is obviously at the first meet. She was a bit of a pessimist. But like, I think she was just a bit like, huh? I don't even understand why you would do that. Like, like that makes no sense to me. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I don't, I don't know what to do. Like, what do I do? <laughs> and she was just like, well, I'll talk to him again, again, and then get it in writing. Like, <laughs> she was like, I was like, what? Like, um, and then I did. We spoke again. Um, in fact, we spoke every day after that. Really? Yeah. Um, in person? On in person, <coughs> yeah. In person. And then we were going back for like, the, you know, like the Christmas period, like where you have like a week yeah. and a half off. I was going back to Birmingham. So I went back to Birmingham and he sent me a phone in the post and said, this is your work phone. See you when you get back. Wow. <laughs> what yeah. phone was it? Oh, it was like an iPhone 5, I think. Oh, nice. Yeah. At the time, I mean, this was like seven years ago. So yeah, like yeah that, was, that, ago, was yeah. The, that was the team. But yeah, but, but to me, I, it could have been a Nokia 3310. Like, mm. I was just like, whoa, like, do you know what I mean? Like, what is like, okay, this is a serious thing. And first of all, I had never been on one of them people to be having work phones and personal <laughs> phones. Even that was new for me. Like, what? So the, even that was like just new transitions. Do you know what I mean? And new waves of working. Um, and then, yeah, moved back and then we started. We didn't even know what it was called at the time, to be fair. It was just an agency. And he'd put in his notice at this point or? Well, mm, not really. But he had began conversation because Iris were our original investors. So, yeah, yeah. At that point, then you gave 
Yeah. Okay. So Iris invested in the company you started together. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. And so, you got a question? No, 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 no can go. Get, carry on there. You, you're in the flow. <laughs> <laughs> so you, uh, so you, you, you get together. He sent you a phone, and um, you incorporate the company in 2017. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And you start trading. June 2017. By June. Uh, and the first conversation you'd had about starting a company was when? November. November. 2016. So it's about six, just over six yeah. months. Yeah. The six company months. was up and running mm -hmm. and you brought on three other co-founders, co -founders, is that yeah. right? Who were they? So we had a creative director. Her name was, is Katie Sumption, Chris Grimwood as client director and Will DeGroote, who is um, culture strategist. Okay. So we, yeah, we worked together like quite intensely um, for the first two to three years, yeah. Wow. So there's five of you at the beginning and yeah. you've got some investment. And what was that first year like? What do you remember? How were you feeling? It was just a whirlwind. Like even thinking about it now, we worked on some, ugh, some really like, projects we just wouldn't work on again but not necessarily because they were bad just because they were just just video projects and content like you know like small stuff just to get us going and to be fair our biggest client and our founding client was Dyson mm -hmm. and we were working on the air purifiers and we were like we had teams up in Malmesbury working with the client directly and that was still a really big deal for us because it's like one it's Dyson and they they've the ones that taken a really big chance on us and we have the story to talk about that and the case studies to talk about that. The more we started talking and the more we started doing stuff, the more we started venturing into like, oh, could we do a music video? So we also did a music video and it was like, oh, could we do some video content for like this recruitment company? And we did a re re um, video content for, and it was just a bit random. Like everything was just a bit random, but also everything aligned to what we believed in as well. Like we were practicing the the idea of like, you know, building teams that made sense for the project and being representative. And we started putting on our creative storyteller event. And our first one was at Red Bull. And I remember saying, yeah, we're going to sell out. And we did. And we had a great, great speaker lineup of like entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs talking about bringing ideas to reality, which is essentially where we were starting from. And then when Red Bull co-signed us, it was like, okay, yes, yeah, sick. Where are we going to go next? And then Twitter offered us their space. And then after Twitter offered the stair space, we said, all right, cool. Can't, we got Converse as a client. Can they offer? And then they offered. And then we started to build a real credibility around like brands and like talking about the things that we really wanted to be doing. Mm -hmm. And then we were doing research and we were, we were doing it off the own, our own back and we were building relationships with like um, universities and colleges and sixth forms and stuff and doing talks. And I think that proactivity around us as an agency, just trying to build a message around inclusivity then allowed us to then tap into clients as well because clients were like oh, okay yeah sick and that's where community building came in for me anyway because we built a real community and we have built a real community around the guest list and like just everything that we have so people really trust us with that so you've uh, you've gone on to start um one month mentors yes which originally was like a pilot you run it for a month in black history month in what year was 2020. that 2020 and that's gone on you've gone on to partner with clarks on <laughs> that project right yep uh tell us tell us a bit about how that developed and evolved and we was that your idea yeah so one month mentors was actually inspired by mine and dan's story of like c-suite access so as an intern I talk about it all the time but that protective energy I had because obviously the CEO was my co-D <laughs> do you know what I mean and a lot of the time if you're an intern or a junior to be honest even sometimes that mid-level you don't know the C-suite mm. um like leaders in 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 your company but because I had that I had a lot of access to a, I know a lot like I knew all of the leadership team ultimately and they knew me by name <laughs> do you know what I mean and I was an intern and I realized what that did for me so talking about it I said to Dan like ah oh, I wonder if we can create something whereby we can give access to people who were either junior or intern or trying to transition in their phase 
two C-suite leaders in the industry. But in a really practical way though, like a li- like quite literal access, like phone numbers, meetups, like all of that. And he was just like, a, and Dan's the kind of person where he's like, I need, to see, I'm, I need to see it on paper. Like, tell me what it looks like. So I went away. I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to map it out. I came back and I was like, okay, I know what it's going to look like now. Like, it's going to be, obviously, C-suite people, they're, they're busy. So one hour a week, but however they want to do that, on the phone, on Zoom, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, but it just has to be an hour a week. But then we create an extensive program of speakers and people who are in ask like sort of network who have really great experience and then we do it around topics and themes that we think people are facing i.e you know how to balance a nine-to-five with a side hustle or you know how to talk about finances or how to get a raise and stuff like that and he was like okay but we've got no money so how are we gonna do that I said don't worry it's cool I got like I got friends <laughs> I got friends <laughs> so it literally was my friends and like my network in the industry that really believed in what we were doing initially that did that and then we put out the call out we done it and we had some really great people like talk on the program participate in the program Um, some of those people are still being mentored today like by those people and then we was like okay we're going to do this around the three communities that we feel like go a lot of the time under resource when it comes to the industry so that the black community the LGBTQ community and women. So we do it around the cultural calendar for those periods. So we just finished our international women's one just gone. We're planning our next pride one. And obviously we do it around Black History Month. The reason why Clark's got involved is because we naturally do a lot of prospecting with clients. We had a conversation with one of the PR girls from Clark's. We told her a lot of the stuff that we've been doing and she was like, ah, oh, the the one month mentor sounds really interesting could you build a proposal and see what a partnership would look like and we did and then we met the cmo and then the cmo tara she's incredible and she's also gay so she got it and like straight away she was just like yeah you know I'm, I'm on board what what do you need from us and although she's based in boston she was still very very active and then me and her built our own relationship and then we would talk about stuff she participated as the first mentor in from the Clark side on the mentor program to see like okay because the first one was pride 2021 and it was a pilot for them because they were like "Mm, let's see if if this is really a thing and they got more than they expected out of it Um, and then we've been doing it ever since and now I sit on the Clark's board the sustainable advisory board look at that yeah and what would you say if you were to summarize the successes that have happened obviously you started off with elephant room and you're doing projects that maybe you wouldn't do be so happy to do now but what are the great successes that the company's had and you're proud of super super proud of our converse and john boyega work that has just been released and that was going for seven months and what is that um so we've done a campaign with converse and it was about really the chuck taylor boot like the shoe and um, John Boyega wanted to increase the representation of film in film, I should say, in film, black when it comes to black filmmakers. So we went out, built an idea around a program, bought on an incredible um production like company, um, mentoring um five young filmmakers from the black community, and commissioned them twenty five grand each to then go out and make a film um, and they've been on a journey with John, with us, with Bounce and then we premiered at the Curzon and a big takeover in Soho um, and we had him talking and they all got interviewed, they've been having press rounds, they were all over billboards and that is like it's been life changing for them ultimately now they've had to leave their jobs and they're doing like festival like you know it's been it's been great for them mm-hmm. Um, and to be a person has, who's been like integral to that, like in terms of like the casting, the sourcing from the very, very first conversations with Converse about what they wanted to achieve. And then having now achieved that has been incredible. And you know what? If I'm being completely honest, I'm just proud of us as a company. Like, because, and when I say as a company, I mean as in like 
it's so so hard to stay true to a mission practically like it's quite easy to say that you're going to do something and write it down as a mission statement but to actively really go out there and try and build a better industry and constantly feel like not not that you're not making progress but oh my gosh this is so slow like we're not seeing what we want to be seeing but actually when you look at the types of projects that we've been able to work on over the course of time and the types of people that we've like have have impacted and been benefited off the back of us doing an event or a talk or a workshop or you know building relationships with people like University of the Arts London or being able to like put on an event online during lockdown in like four weeks and then get people from California to talk about it and then build relationships with like foundations in New York like what like how like how did you get here and you haven't even you haven't even been going five like solid solid years mm. um I think that is like has been really te- a real testament to just us and the hard work that we've put in and like the dedication that we've like created around it and and just making sure that we've got the right team in place to support it regardless of the knockbacks and the setbacks because there has been but we've just had to sort of you know been really agile and flexible and adaptable and it's been it's been great very exciting and now when you look back at that decision for dan to chat to you offer your job in the same meeting say well let's both leave if you look at what you've achieved you know together and as a company all together and impact you've had on that it makes sense you know Mm. if you go for and you go forward in maybe five years time and what maybe you may achieve and what you may become people will go well that was a great decision and isn't it funny how things can change and really it sounds like dan saw in you you know the great skills resourcefulness talent vision Mm. uh that you had drive you know that can do make it happen attitude he saw it and did something about it which i think isn't is what a lot of people don't have they don't see it it doesn't mean Mm -hmm. the talent and the skills and the potential isn't there in so many people you know like you and not like you that don't Mm -hmm. get seen and so i think it's a great story of of someone seeing that and doing something about it and who knows how many other great companies will exist and and grow if people see see what's there yeah i mean hopefully <laughs> <laughs> um yeah yeah i mean there's there's a real skill in and and dan also taught me that in fact there's a real skill in being able to scope and nurture talent like mm. it's not not everyone can do it not everyone even sees talent like you said and for me i think i have that skill but I didn't know I had that skill because I thought it was just, a, I thought it was a, a hobby. I thought it was like an interesting, I think it was like, oh, I just like meeting young people. I just like listening to new, I like, and, and Dan was like, no, that's a, that's a skill that you have mm-hmm. that you, it just needs nurturing and ch- like shaping. And then we can, we can build that into a proposition for a business. And that's why you're, you're head of talent because like you're not just head of talent you the reason why you're head of talent is because you know talent do you know what I mean and um and I, and I just didn't get that for a really long time isn't that ironic that you can see talent in other people yeah but you didn't see it in yourself in myself, I know <laughs> how ironic isn't it but that's it's not your fault really is it it's sort of like I, put, I imagine there's a lot of people who have your talent um who who don't don't see yeah. it as a, as a talent yeah, and and it is, it is a talent that needs nurturing, like you said. Like it 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 does, it does need a development practice to it. And then now, like me, like you know, I have a t- we have a talent program um coordinator, and I'm her direct line manager, and I get it now. Like I'm nurturing a talent essentially, and um and we both give each other feedback, and we have a real open relationship. And she was just like, ah, oh, like I've never been line managed like this before, like ever. But this is this is the best way for me in order to grow and you know and and I want the best for her of course it seems like a great example of each one teach one yeah and you taught Dan a load of things he didn't know and he taught you a load of things you didn't know and that was a healthy 
healthy relationship which yeah. allows you to as a team as a company all the people who work with the elephant room to achieve great things which is a great a great story for people to hear how how it can really be done well yeah definitely and also just the team around us as well like he, he, i remember him saying that there's the client partner the creative director and the strategy director and we all we have we have that in our agency and we were interviewing a young intern that we're taking on and he said to dan so who's more important <laughs> mm. and dan was like it's a bit like a three-legged stool mm. no one's really more like once one's gone it's like it's tipped like everyone everyone is so integral to that process and they're so like so valued that there is no no more important like we need everyone in order to have that balance and i was like good analogy <laughs> that's a good one and he's like it's true though isn't it it's like you, you need you you need everyone and and i think that is also a testament to the team that we have as well like mm -hmm, everyone mm -hmm. has has built it to where like where where it is today what do you see could be the benefits if more organizations built that bridge between entry level and c-suite when you empower somebody you give them the ability to do things they've never done before and then once you give someone the ability to do that you see things that have never been done before and that's how we have like innovation and like, you know things just like constantly evolving because people have been empowered enough to say you know what? yeah i can do this do you know what i mean so had dan not given me quote unquote it wasn't even necessarily permission but he almost gave me the permission to be me mm -hmm. and to be free go up do it just do it just do it try and i always did and i always came back with something new and then lo and behold i, I created the one month mentors which is now we've got like, who knew it would have been here but he gave me the ability to feel empowered that i could do it do you know what i mean and it's the same with when i was at guap you know when i created the blacklist who knew would be here who knew adidas would be sponsoring us and converse and nike would be giving us their space and would be taking over no one knew that but they were like the guys are like no you're onto something here do it like do it and let's see where it goes so i think it's just about making sure that people feel empowered to be able to do things they want to do and then just you know it's trial and error really isn't it? so looking back your what impacts and how has your mother's upbringing of you you know on her own from from when you were four years old mm -hmm. and the values of your father that she instilled in you how has that helped you achieve things you've achieved i think uh firstly shout out my mom she's a real og mm. because it, raising a child a child i can imagine is not easy <laughs> so to be raising four and grieving your husband and then having to just deal with your own self i can imagine i don't even think i'd be able to survive do you know what i mean and i think because i've seen such strength in her in the ability to do that i think i've genuinely genuinely sorry grown up with the idea that nothing is impossible like there is actually nothing you cannot do if you don't put your mind to like yes it's going to be hard of course it is but then really nothing worth having is going to come easy do you know what i mean so it's like if you get something easy you probably lose it pretty quickly or you probably lose it easily as well and i think that's what that's what that taught me like that strength like she she just persevered like and persevered obviously in a way in which like she probably didn't get to build the career that she wanted for herself and she sacrificed loads but then she also taught me the art of sacrifice and knowing that you are going to have to sacrifice in order to get what you want or in order to achieve whatever it is that you've set out to achieve. And I'm okay with that. Do you know what I mean? So I'm okay with loss. I'm okay with sacrifice. I'm okay with challenges. I'm okay with taking on some things that I've never taken on before because she's shown me that you can do all those things and still get to where you need to be. And I think with, with my dad passing, it's also a case of level of like, I'm really I'm I'm really sort of like um it's really important to me to be have a balance whether that be mentally physically spiritually and I I've only really understood that I'd say the past four or five years of being me and I think the element of that spirituality has come a lot from my dad passing 
and knowing that rah like you know what even though you're not here I feel like you're here because you you there's still so much of you that lives in me do you know what I mean and that's because people around me i.e my mom has allowed that to to be present and I've been open to the idea of that even do you even though you're in this spiritual world and I think that that has also allowed me to understand the balance for myself mentally so and because I you know I believe in God and um you know I pray on all of those things I feel like they're just all just they're all just coming to one I'm like okay this all makes sense now like this is all I need this is what I need in order to be my best self as well as obviously you know achieving all that I need to achieve um professionally so I think that my mom has just she just really shown me the art of like living but then also sacrificing and although you you shouldn't have to live to sacrifice like that should not be like your journey but there is going to be an element of you in order to live you have to sacrifice Do you know what I mean and I think and I think that she's shown us that a lot not choosing to remarry and all of those things because she's just like you know what I'm just trying to build the best life possible for my children and that's what that's going to look like for me and I'm okay with that I'm like yeah like good for you like I mean sad but it's good for you do you know what I mean because you've made that decision by yourself and you actually have achieved what you've needed to achieve by raising four children so mm-hmm. I rate her highly shout out to Shani's mom yeah, shout out to Shani's mom <laughs> and isn't that I think that's one of the beautiful things about life is you know your mother and your father instilling values in you mm-hmm. has played a role in you achieving what you've achieved and and you've had that focus of giving to others giving mm-hmm. others opportunity because of what you've experienced and they've now gone on to do great things mm-hmm. and they will no doubt have those values in them to want to help others yeah and that's so. how just one person or two people your parents can have you know impact not just in their lifetime but in the future mm. just from from wanting to hand down to the next generation and and um as you said like raise raise amazing children yeah yeah and i'm and i'm not even where i want to be yet so i can imagine that like when it when it just comes to a point where if and when i decide to have children i can do the same for them and it just continues like you said so but yeah for sure <laughs> Can you summarize three lessons from the challenges that you faced in your life that you would tell yourself at 18, if you could go back in time? And imagine Shani sitting, 18 year old Shani sitting here now. Well, I take it back to my saying that I always say, which is, what is the point in learning if you don't have any intention to teach? I think that that is a lesson that I learned really early on. I think sometimes people put titles on you that you don't necessarily put on yourself there's a spider-man quote and i can't remember it is but it's basically like with great power comes great responsibility i think that was it yeah yeah and um shout out spider-man yeah shout out peter parker you know um and you have to be okay with that you just have to be and i think if you are someone that wants to lead with intent you are naturally going to be a part or somewhat of those labels whether or not you put them on yourself, other people are going to put them on you. And the third one, I think is just like to just remember to enjoy yourself. <laughs> like I just like, I feel like sometimes you get so caught up in work and wanting to be a successful person. And, you know, you, you neglect the hobbies and interests and like, it's stuff that you just really enjoy and that really make you happy and I'd say literally within the past year and a half I've picked up back going to the theatre and going to shows seeing dance shows going to see poetry like those are the things that really make me happy and I I love I love that part of me and I don't ever want to lose that again do you know what I mean but I but I did for a couple of years and I realized that yeah I don't want to I don't want to do that again so if if I was talking to my 18 year old self I'd be like do not lose it like keep going to poetry shows keep going to festivals keep enjoying yourself rave if you want to like just do whatever makes you happy and yeah just just enjoy your life lovely I think there's a great lesson in there that even if people can't put 
your skills in a box and can't label it as it's this oh you're that or mm-hmm. you fit in here doesn't mean it's not valuable and if anything it probably means you can bring something to the table that isn't there that needs to be that could take things to the next level mm-hmm. so if you're someone who feels that way like you know i don't really know what it is i can do it doesn't mean it's not valuable and you really just need to um take action like you did and yeah. do things and people then see from what you've done like your value and go okay i can't name it but it's definitely good yeah and it's great yeah. and it's worth leaving my 11 year <laughs> career behind at this company to start a new company with so i think that's going to be great for people listening who may be feeling that way um to know that yeah they they've got skills and they can do great things yeah for sure mm. some things that i got from from what you shared is like leading with grace is definitely a special it's a special skill to have because it takes it takes an empathic approach which is not as easy to do day to day in a mm. quick world but that can get you a deeper connection that leads to the results that you wish to get but also with your time at iris that aspect of doing what you enjoy mm. expressing yourself the way you want to express yourself you never know where that can lead you as well mm-hmm. and i think that's a really important thing for everyone and it connects to what you said at the end in terms of don't lose sight of what you enjoy to do mm-hmm. you know people will get a job sometimes then they look it's been six months then they look it's been 18 months yeah. they've just been working they haven't done the things that they enjoy and mm. you lose something when you when you live like that because you're not giving yourself those moments of joy that inspire you and push you forwards yeah absolutely and i've been there it's not it's not cute <laughs> so so yeah like I'd, I'd encourage everyone to just continue to do what they enjoy for sure all right well keep keep doing what you enjoy keep doing amazing things making change inspiring people and making a difference and taking action your great story of you know rubber hits the road you know that's when stuff happens and so uh really looking forward to seeing what's next in the in the life of of shani mears Mm -hmm. thank you thank you very much thanks for coming thank you (laughs) thank you